I want you to get together. Hello everyone. This video today is going to be a more of a summary of one of my most recent live shows, The Truth of Therapy Sessions number 29. Um, in this episode, I go on for two hours um, giving a very long presentation about the origins of modern clowning and just where we get the image of a modern clown from exactly, specifically. It's its roots within the Comédie de l'Art movement of France and Italy um, through to the British pantomime and the character of Harley Quinn through to the clown and where the clown costume comes from and how it got popularised into the 20, 20th and 21st century. This Harlequin character comes specifically from a movement of Harlequinades within Italy and France during the um, Renaissance period of the 15th, 16th and 17th century. The author here, as an example, shows a quote from a character called Mercury in a play called The Harlequin Student. At the end of the play he says, Down, down to hell from whence ye rose. The Greek god here speaks to what was generally known, but has lately been forgotten. The origin of Harlequin is demonic and lies within the dark recesses of antiquity. The outstanding comic figure on the Commedia dell'Arte stage was the masked, motley dressed, acrobatic character known as Arlecchino, also known as Harlequin in Germany and Harlequin in France and England. Such was the popularity of Arlecchino that the character, who had a secondary role at first, he was usually the second zany, a buffoon or clown soon took centre stage, and was often portrayed by the company's leading actor. Arlecchino was not only the most memorable of the masked characters of the Comédie de l'Arte, but also the most enigmatic, owing to the shroud of mystery surrounding his origin, name, manner and costume. The Italian Arlecchino had existed in other guises and functioned in other venues long before he became the dominant male figure on the stage of the European Renaissance. In previous antique manifestations, he was anything but the zany, doltish servant. To fathom the complex essence of Arlecchino, therefore, it is requisite that the elements contributing to the holism of this character be assessed fully. The ancestral lineage of Arlecchino is both ancient and exotic. There are two principal veins of his bloodline, first being the central and northern European barbaric cultures of the wild men, and the second, the classical traditions of the Mediterranean. The oldest known reference that relates to Arlecchino's barbaric lineage clearly show his ancestors to be demonic. Odericus Vitalis, the author of a Norman manuscript discussing an experience of a Franciscan monk, explains that when returning late at night to his abode in Bonneville, near Chartres, he was accosted by a hellish band. Clearly, the monk in the narrative had been beset by the family of Herchelin a spectral host of relentless demons who marauded the countryside on certain winter nights, at the same time of the year as the carnival's celebrations, rampaging through the forests and valleys, destroying everything in their path. The author recognises his assailants as the nefarious group that had come to be known among the populace as the Wild Horde, infamous beings out of a very widespread European folkloric tradition. This procession of damned souls is led by a gigantic figure with a club, whose proper name is given as Helikins. This will prove to be the earliest known written version of the name that would ultimately become Arlecchino or Harley Quinn. You note in this passage here that the Wild Horde is referenced many times in my own work about the cookery traditions of Eastern Europe in which men dress like wild beasts and animals and partake in a festival of gluttony. This has its roots in early worship of Dionysus. Dionysus himself was said to be a man, a giant of sorts, a god, who roamed from village to village, centering his camps within woods and glens, bringing with him a huge party of sorts, in which satyrs and mirnads would follow him through orgiastic pleasure and the partake of alcohol and drugs. It's also worth noting that Dionysus is the patron saint of theatre. In this belief system of barbaric origin, the first two veins of Arlecchino is seen to derive from a demon named Heliquin, and then Harlequin out of French folklore, who becomes manifest in literary texts in the 13th century. But this figure itself is derivative. 
The ascendant of the medieval French demon evolved out of Norse and Teutonic mythology beings who came to be known in Germany, in the adjacent areas, as Tufel Halekin, or Helikin, Hel or Hella, being the goddess of the Norse underworld. Helikin is the probable source of Hearn the Hunter, the phallic horned god, variously known in the British Isles under such names as the Green Man, Jack in the Green, Robin of the Hood, Robin Goodfellow, and Robin Hood. These are all manifestations of the King of the May, the ancient fertility deity whose phallus became the symbolic maypole featured in May Day celebrations held throughout Europe to welcome the rebirth and impregnation of Mother Earth in spring. Such fertility figures in the British Isles and on the continent derive from a very early, perhaps Paleolithic, being generally known as the Wild Man, a larger-than-life, often gigantic creature covered in hair, fur, lichen and twigs, or leaves whose primal identity was tied to the woodlands, symbolised by the uprooted tree he carried, usually over his shoulder or in his hand. Later in carnival celebrations, in the wedding night pandemonium called Chivalry, in the rite known as the Wild Man Hunt, a massive studded club was often substituted for a traditional tree. The Wild Man came to be associated with mythological beings, and himself was held to be demonic. One of the identities of the savage is Orcus, literally translated the Wild Man, a Telluric deity out of the Gallo-Roman era, who led processions of the dead and who, as a demon of death, had an association with Pluto or Hades, the lord of the underworld in classical mythology. The functions of Orcus as leader of the Wild Horde came to be preempted by the demon Helikin, whose name was variously given as Harlequin, Harlechin, or Harlequin. Within the second vein, the complex world of classical and eastern mythologies, there are several figures who are clearly antecedents of Arlecchino's earliest relative, the Wild Man, such as the hairy Enkidu, who, in the Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh, lives with and protects wild animals. There's also the giant Polyphemus, the leader of the Cyclopses, in the Odyssey, and the fabled Hercules, who wore the pelt of a lion and brandished a great club as did the half-animal, half-human centaurs who were also likely antecedents of the wild man. So too were the woodland deities Sylvanus, who had the sapling of a cypress in his hand, and especially Silenus, who, like the wild man, carried the uprooted tree from his forest realm, and was depicted with a thick coat of hair on Greek and Roman craters, sculptures and murals. What is verifiable is Arlecchino's rootstock, the demonic and deific ancestry out of Norse and Teutonic beliefs on the one hand, and, in a different manner, out of Mediterranean mythology. His genealogical tree is replete with Telluric and cosmic ancestry out of these diverse systems of belief, with probable origins at the dawn of humanity. The impact of the demonic figure that was Herlikin must have been great in the popular imagination for it to have been preserved for so many centuries as a myth. Arlecchino's chameleon nature is made manifest not only in his myriad of roles but also in the variegated costume. Originally on the Renaissance stage he dressed in a multicoloured patchwork resembling tatters. In his earlier tattered garb, Arlecchino has an association with the Hesut beings out of folklore of Scandinavia, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and Tyrolean Italy, the traditional figure of the wild man. More frequent than the replacement of furs by feathers was the use of close-fitting tights and bodices covered with little bits of coloured rags or flax to simulate tufts. The wild men who performed their revels in Basel in 1435, wore green and red tufts, and the wild men and women rendered on the Swiss tapestries of the same period wore fluff of any colour. The sartorial tradition of the wild man and his demonic relatives and associates were inherited by the harlequin of the modern stage. These rags were systematised into interlocking triangular or lozenge-shaped patches, but the original harlequin of the 17th century wore them at random 
in a manner similar to a wild demon's garb. What I believe we're seeing there is the early representation of the wild man's skin as being multicolored and patterned like that of a serpent, let's say. It's also said in this book that the mask that Harlequin is seen wearing in most early depictions is a direct representation similar to that of a demonic face found throughout the folkloric traditions of the wild men. You can see here slight lumps representing horns, sharp pointy stub-nosed features, small eyes, prominent brow ridges and a lot of hair. The ancestors of Arlecchino, no matter their province, have been associated with the demonic through the long centuries before his inception as a stage figure. The remnants of Arlecchino's inheritance from the pagan past are evident in his traditional costume, mask and other physical acriments, as well as the variation on his name. As Cope says while assessing the cockney character Joey the Clown, named after Joseph Grimaldi, a star of the British pantomime, when we view the character in this light, we can see the history of Harlequin's decline in the 18th century popular theatre quite differently. The clown who replaced Harlequin was actually the resurrection of his original form and spirit, as the half-man, half-demon, who erupted from the shadowy history of Germanic devils. Arlecchino came from the shades of an older chaos to become its permanent comic voice, but one passed from interpreter to interpreter through the centuries. In conclusion, the demonic image of the central and northern European folklores was joined with the comic spirits out of the Attic Theatre, the Commedia dell'Arte. You can find that from the 15th century onwards during the Renaissance within Italy and Europe, there was a rich tradition of harlequinades and shows performing with these characters. And they slowly developed, as you read in that book, into more of a comic um, character or perhaps a romantic love interest rather than the zany, demonic, jester-like character of its original form. The Harlequin character came to England in the early 17th century and took centre stage in the derived genre of the Harlequinade, developed in the early 18th century by the Lincoln Fields theatre actor manager John Rich, who played the role under the name of Lunt. He developed the character of Harlequin into a mischievous magician who was easily able to evade Pantaloon and his servants to woo Columbine. Harlequin used his magic bat or slapstick to transform the scene from pantomime into Harlequinade and to magically change the settings to various locations during the chase scenes. As the Harlequinade portion of the English pantomime developed, Harlequin was routinely paired with the character Clown. Two developments in 1800, both involving Joseph Grimaldi, greatly changed the pantomime characters. Grimaldi starred as Clown in Charles Dibdin's 1800 pantomime, The Harlequin and the Flying World. At Sadler's Wells Theatre, which was owned by this Charles Dibdin of the day. For this elaborate production, Charles Dibdin and Grimaldi introduce new costume designs. Clown's costume was garishly colourful, patterned with large diamonds and circles and fringed with tassels or ruffs, instead of the tatty servant's outfit that had been used for a century. The new production was a hit, and the new costume design was copied by others in London. Later that same year, at the Theatre Royale on Drury Lane, in Harlequin Amulet, Harlequin was modified to become the romantic and mercurial instead of mischievous, leaving Grimaldi's mischievous and brutish clown as the undisputed agent of chaos and the foil for the more sophisticated Harlequin, who retained and developed stylized dance poses during the 19th century. The most influential pair playing Harlequin and the clown in Victorian England were the Payne brothers active during the 1860s and 1870s, who contributed to the development of 20th century slapstick comedy. So what we find here is that somebody called Charles Dibdin invented the costume of a clown for his particular Harlequin productions. As we find that Harlequin as a character has its roots 
in the pagan traditions of the wild man of Europe. Its character changed from that of a devil into a hopeless romantic, and the devilish character was swapped out for the clown instead, popularised by the famous Joseph Grimaldi, the most famous clown known in the world, and the one who has been given the honour of inventing the modern clown as we know it in terms of aesthetics. The truth is, the costume of a clown was created by Charles Dibdin, who was, indeed, a Freemason. Now, I did a bit of digging, and I found this Lodge of Research book from the Leicester Lodge from 1932 to 1933, in which a, partic a particular member of this lodge by the name of R.H. Riley wrote a, a memorial to the brother Charles Dibdin a hundred years after his death. In this manuscript, you find that he was asked by another brother to write some kind of uh, memorial to him in this, in this note that which was to be read at one of the meetings. And he says this, Some two years ago, our late revered uh, brother Thorpe placed in my hands a very old and tattered copy of the book of the words of brother Charles Dibdin, Masonic Pantomime, entitled Harlequin Freemason, with a request that I would give some account of the composer, together with any other information, and if possible, a selection of the music of the Harlequin Freemason. Now he goes on here to explain how he was an amazing musician and poet who popularised sailors' songs specifically for the British Navy, but it also then goes on to share with us the entire script for his Freemason pantomime, named the Harlequin Freemason. And it's basically a glorification of the Freemason uh, mantra and rules and laws and attitude. And then the show itself, which this was written for, ends with people dressed in all the different garbs of Freemasonry throughout the centuries, paraded as though representing a true history of the development of Freemasonry from its very inception of the antediluvian age through to the modern day. So in the 1800s, Charles Dibdin created a brand new costume design for the clown character in a harlequinard culture that had existed for hundreds of years before him, and thus introduced the image of a clown that we know today in popular culture. And it was Joseph Grimaldi who popularised this through his performances, and in a way took over the harlequin as the main character within future pantomimes and harlequinades. It was a Freemason who created the costume of a clown. And as we know, Freemasonry is nothing more than a continuation of the antediluvian serpent cults which worshipped fallen angels and the Nephilim as kings and gods. Nothing has changed since that time. And what this Freemason has done here, as far as I'm concerned, is brought his gods onto the stage, which wouldn't have taken much because Already, the roots of Harlequin itself, which the clown derives from as a zany character, already had its roots in the demonic wildmen of Europe. From this, all throughout the 19th and 20th century, circuses suddenly began to arise. We can say that the modern circus began in the 18th century with Philip Astley, a cavalry officer from England who opened an amphitheatre in Lambeth to display his horse riding tricks. But from there, the circus has developed into something far more extravagant than mere horse tricks involving animals and clowns the like. The same clown imagery that was invented by Charles Dibdin in the 1800s was continued into the modern circus, specifically by Barnum and Bailey in The Greatest Show on Earth, who used clowns regularly in his own circus, which toured from 1897 to 1902. But then Barnum and Bailey, two well-known Freemasons themselves, joined with the Ringling Brothers, who were also members of Freemasonry to create a combined circus. The interesting thing about this is that American circuses disseminated the image of Solomon broadly between 1892 and 1929. The circuses operated by John Robinson, Barnum and Bailey and the Ringling Brothers all offered massive circus spectaculars reproducing the magnificence of Solomon's court. Freemasons were in control of each of these productions. John Robinson himself was a Freemason, as was P.T. Barnum. 
all seven of the Ringling Brothers, as well as their father, were members of the Baraboo Lodge of Number 34 of Baraboo, Wisconsin. The Barnum and Bailey Spectacular was designed, arranged, and produced under the personal direction of Velocity Kiralfi, an English theatrical producer who belonged to the Masonic Lodge in London. For a production of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, which toured the nation, the Ringling Brothers purchased their costumes from the Hanson Arms Company, a leading fraternal supply house mentioned earlier, and acquired scenic backdrops painted by Sosman and Landis Theatrical Design Studio that specialised in producing Scottish Rite ritual backdrops for Masonic temples. The circus spectacle touring the country then was produced by Freemasons, featured characters from the Masonic ritual, garbed in costumes from a Masonic supply house, and performed before backdrops created by a firm specialising in Masonic scenery. So, to best quickly summarise this story, Harley Quinn is a char prominent character from the Harlequinades of the Comédie de l'Art movement moving through Europe, specifically France and Italy, during the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries. During this renaissance period of theatre, it was well known that the character of the Harlequin had its roots within the wild men of Europe, specific demonic characters discussed at length in earlier medieval times. Harlequin itself is a direct representation of the wild men of Europe and of demonic forces. This Harlequin character played the role of a trickster initially, before devolving throughout the Renaissance period to be nothing more than a hopeless romantic chasing after a specific love interest. The side character of the clown, which was a derivative from the zany characters which came from the Harlequin character himself, soon became the leading role and replaced Harlequin as the agent of chaos within the Harlequin Age shows. Joseph Grimaldi, during the 1800 periods, highly popularised the character of the clown through his own work, actions and performances. He worked closely with a Freemason called Charles Dibdin and performed a show in which Charles Dibdin reinvented the costume designs of the traditional Harlequinade and changed the clown's outfit from a traditional servant's ragged garb to that of the psychedelic clown we know of today in the modern era. Evolutions of this form continued throughout the 19th and 20th century. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we find that circuses were growing in popularity, specifically in America, through the works of Barnum and Bailey and the Ringling Brothers before they became a combined circus. All of these brothers and the people involved in these shows were Freemasonic to the core, and they in fact created shows specifically to venerate their own stories and rituals within the Masonic rites. And they did this through the symbol of a circus involving clowns. The clown character was created by Freemasons. It was popularised by Freemasons. The clown represents the Nephilim spirits. Though the author of the book I was reading snippets from at the start of this video equates the Harlequin character strictly to only the wild men of Europe, I think it could also apply to all the other cultures around the world who have their own ancestral spirit worship traditions. And in those traditions, there were outfits which are very similar to that of the wild men. I do believe all cultures all around the world, not just specifically the European ones, have a way of representing these demons through their folk traditions. And they all have very similar features, which could be akin to quite clownish in nature from a Western perspective today. But as we said, the clown has its roots from Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn's roots come from the demonic representations of the devil in the European folklore of the wild men. We also know that the clown was adopted by Freemasons in their shows and the outfit was changed to be far more psychedelic and trippy and representative of Nephilim as they know them to look. The Freemasons worship the Nephilim. They worship them as their kings and gods, just as they did in the antediluvian age in the serpent cults then. They believe that the Nephilim are going to return. They are working to do everything they can to bring the return of the Nephilim back to the earth. Of course, working hand in hand with Lucifer, the Lightbringer, the true god of their fraternal order. So I hope this makes it clear just where we get the modern clown from. Who truly created it and why? It's not 
a coincidence. It's not by accident. It's truly by design. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I think you should watch my entire series. There's up to 31 episodes now, including this one. And also I do a weekly live show where I discuss these things more in depth. Everything you just heard me say was discussed in far more detail and at far more length within the live show last Sunday, which you can find here on my YouTube channel, Truth or Therapy Session number 29. I hope this video is a more condensed version of this information, and I hope it's useful to you guys out there when people ask you just what the clown's all about and where did it come from, if you try and tell them that the Nephilim do indeed look like clowns. Thanks for listening, guys. If you like what I do, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can find the links down below. And you can also support the book I am currently writing on this topic. The GoFundMe link is also down below. But as always, thanks for listening and God bless. I want you to get together.